it is my um, set duty to announce that this is going to be the last talk of uh, this lovely conference. Nonetheless, it is of course with great pleasure that I announce uh, Kevin Tibble and his talk on the emergence of technical structure in the cosmology. Thanks, and thanks to the organisers. It's been a really wonderful meeting. I've learned a huge amount, found it really relaxing, enjoyable, um, and it's getting late in the day, people are feeling a bit sleepy. I'll try not to say anything interesting, so if you want to have a little nap, don't worry, it's okay. Um, this is joint work from Nick Huggett. Um, we've been thinking a little bit about a particular model for the emergence of time, and really treating this not as, as, a, as a kind of candidate for a theory of what the universe is really like, but more on a, on a kind of simple cosmological model that we can use as a, a, a toy model for a case study of being more precise about what we could mean by the emergence of time. Um, in particular, thinking about the consistency of the various approximations used in this model um, and the extent in which they, uh, we can understand the story about the emergence of time or the approximate <coughs> emergence of time in this model as being explanatory. Um, and, and in the end, we conclude, uh, contra some claims in the philosophical literature, that this, this approach, particularly using uh, born Oppenheimer and semi-classical uh, kind of approximation techniques, um, is a self-consistent approach, we can derive um, in a consistent way three types of temporal structure, which I'll talk about in a slightly uh, idiosyncratic way, but hopefully clear way, as chrono-ordinal, chronometric, and chrono-directed structures. And we think that there's, in a, in a, in a particular sense, um, an, ex an explanation of the emergence of, of these structures in at least the first two cases. Uh, I'm going to use a, a may, maybe slightly flat-footed notion of explanation that comes from the literature and uh, explanation of mathematics of being able to answer what if things had been different questions. So in the first two structures, we can, we can tell a story about how emergence works, uh, and that story gives some kind of explanatory uh, kind of value. In the third case, we can tell a, a, a story about emergence, but it's not clear how explanatory it is, at least at this stage. And it's really going to focus on a specific model, uh, mainly worked on by... Klaus Kiefer, uh, but then some, some kind of extensions to that, particularly in the context of the era of time, in work that Klaus Kiefer did with uh, Dieter Zay in, in, in 1995. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this notion of structures of time, the three, three words that I just told you about, um, talk in some detail, but hopefully not too much detail, about the, the Kiefer, Kiefer, Kiefer analysis of the model and a particular extension of it due to Kiefer and Zay. And then I'll, I'll kind of go back to some arguments by Hugh Price, made in his kind of classic 1996 book, and see the extent to which those arguments, which in, in the context I'm talking about, specifically targeting a uh, particular interpretation of the no-boundary proposal by Hawking and collaborators, going to consider yeah. the extent to which these also apply or don't also apply in the Kiefer's A model. Uh, I'm a little worried I'll talk too much, so perhaps maybe if I get to half an hour or so, wave at me and I'll, I'll, I'll try and wrap up quickly. Um, so really, I want to make a, a, I think, trivial distinction, which, but I think a very important one, between three different notions of temporal structure. Um, I think we shouldn't necessarily talk about time being there or time not being there. I think we should think about time as a complex concept and there's parts of the concept and it is the sum of these structures. Um, I know that tomorrow morning we have a session labelled unstructured time, but I would like to propose to you that there is no such thing as unstructured time. <laughs> and time only exists in virtue of at least some of these structures obtaining, at least approximately. Um, so the most basic structure I want to call chrono-ordinal, and this is about an undirected time ordering of events. The second structure, chronometric structure, is a more familiar word. Uh, all of these do commit the sin of combining uh, Greek and Latin, which hopefully people forgive me. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't start it. Um, so chronometric structure is just giving us a real valued assignment of duration between pairs of events. And this third structure, which is essentially the chrono-ordinal structure <coughs> plus some kind of direction. Um, so it's the directed ordering of events. Yeah. But they're not three grades in the sense of being logically stronger than the previous one. Not necessarily, no. Um, as I'll say in a second, you can use some of them to define each other. Um, but I think unless we have at least some of this structure, um, there's a sense in which we don't have time. Um, 
but we, we don't have to have them all emerge at the same time. Uh, and that's kind of the point, that, that you can differentially find these structures uh, it, or derive these structures in, in these quantum cosmological models. Um, and so hopefully these are quite easy to, to kind of cash out. The coronal ordinal structure, it's essentially what Mataggart talked about in terms of the C theory, something that someone called Matt Farr has written a lot about Cambridge. Um, really the idea is we just can order events in an undirected temporal line. Uh, and this may not be a kind of structure that obtains for all events, but at least some events we can get a partial order. And so really what we want to talk about is say, if we have some events, A, B, and C, that are in the domain of the structure, uh, we can say whether B is between A and C, but not whether uh, A or C is after. So it's, it's kind of a thin structure. Uh, the chronometric structure is, is, is we're getting real valued assignments uh, to pairs of events, uh, at least in, uh, in some subset of the events. And because they can be positive and negative, we can actually use the structure to define chrono-ordinal structure implicitly. The chrono-directed structure is, is close to what McTaggart called the B-series, and it's really the chrono-ordinal structure plus some kind of temporal orientation. And so I, I'm not taking that any of this to be controversial or particularly um, innovative, but I think it's just useful to be very clear about picking out what we mean in, in particular contexts. And so rather than talking about order and time, I'll talk about these three particular structures, just to be very clear and precise. Um, so what do we mean by emergence of temporal structure? I propose this would be a sensible way of, of packaging things. This is really um, drawn quite a lot from Nick's work with Chris in the eagerly awaited book, uh, which I'm hope, sure is going to come out very soon. I hope so, too. <laughs> uh, so we have three steps, right? So we have some uh, theory with some equations, and a given temporal structure is not explicitly specified in the basic equations of some model. In, in this context, we talk about quite simple cosmological, quantum cosmological models. We then have some derivation of the relevant structure, or more, more relevantly, some approximation to that structure um, in some limit of the model. And then we find that the derivation has some extra property that's physically salient or explanatory. It gives us some kind of, uh, kind of why the relevant temporal structure uh, obtains or, or, or um, approximately obtains. So we're actually, we've got some kind of understanding or explanatory virtue through the derivation that allows us to tell a story about the emergence of that structure. And of course, this notion of emergence is fully compatible with, with reduction. It's not a, a kind of metaphysically strong notion of emergence. Um, it's quite close to the kind of Butterfield idea of, of emergence in terms of a kind of approxim approximate limiting um, derivation. OK. So that was just kind of setting the scene, giving us some conceptual tools. What I want to do now is just talk a little bit about a model. Um, and the framework I'm going to be working within um, is a canonical quantization of general relativity, the kind of old geometrodynamics program. Um, for our purposes, this will be perfectly sufficient. Uh, there's no claim that this is the final answer. There's one particular issue of this framework, which I'll come back to at the end relating to singularities. Um, Perhaps another issue, actually, that will come up along the way. But for us, it will be perfectly adequate. And many of the things that I say, I think, would apply more generally to other programs or more sophisticated approaches. So we're really following the, the, the Dirac approach to canonical quantization of general relativity, uh, particularly in, a, in these very simple finite dimensional cosmological models or mini superspace models. Uh, we end up with a timeless zero energy eigenstate equation, the famous Wheeler DeWitt equation. Um, and the project is going to be looking at a particular model of the wheeler dewitt equation and seeing how we can extract time from this, this kind of frozen formalism. And some of you may know, I in fact don't endorse this program. I've written quite a lot of papers arguing for a different approach. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to bracket those criticisms and that view. If you're interested, I've written uh, quite a few papers with Sean Gribb, but there's a couple of particular, I think, accessible ones from back in 2016. Um, so, I mean, this quote is quite famous. Everyone seems to read it out, but I think it's so great. I'm going to read it out as, as well. Um, so this is from Wheeler. Um, and I think really trying to understand the implication of, of, of the equation that bears its name to some extent. Uh, 
The time ordering of events is a notion devoid of meaning. The concept of space-time and time itself are not primary but secondary ideas in the structure of physical theory. These concepts are valid in the classical approximation. However, they have neither meaning nor application under circumstances when quantum gravitational effects become important. Then one has to forgo the, nature, uh, the view of nature in which every event, past, present or future, occupies its preordained position in a grand catalogue called space-time. There is no space-time, there is no time, there is no before, there is no after. The question of what happens next is without meaning. Um, it's like proper Wheeler at his best. Uh, okay, so let's just look at the model. So uh, this is a very simple model. In fact, to some extent, I challenge you to find a simpler model. Um, we really, we're working in FLLW type universe. Um, all we really have is a, is a uh, we can sp specify the spatial curvature, uh, positive, negative, or, or zero. We have these dynamical degrees of freedom in terms of a geometric degrees of freedom by the scale factor. <coughs> and then we have a massive degree of freedom, which is just a homogeneous scalar field. So we're homogeneous, isotropic, finite dimensional, no cosmological constant. We do have a mass term, though. And so it's not, you can make it even simpler if you got rid of the mass, I guess. And so we end up with this, um, ignore the, this bit for, for the time being, we end up with a Hamiltonian, uh, which has a kinetic bit relating to the geometric degree of freedom, kinetic bit relating to the massive degree of freedom, uh, some kind of mass terms and some coupling, which make it a bit more complicated. We go through the kind of canonical quantization procedure, and there's that we promote the Hamiltonian to an operator annihilating the wave function. The wave function is just on a space of these, uh, these variables. We've taken a, a variable substitution from the scale factor A, just taking a logarithm, which I, I, I almost always use this alpha variable, because it's a little bit well better behaved. Um, and we have a Planck mass in here. So we've, we've got a Hamiltonian, we've got a, a, a kind of zero energy eigenstate equation. There's no time evolution in this equation. We have two spatial variables, uh, one relating to matter, one relating to geometry. We want to try and see how we can extract time from this framework. And the, the kind of explicit details from this, for the most part, I'm following a paper from back in 1988. But if you want to go into a lot more detail, uh, Kiefer's book is it's got everything pretty much that I'm going to write down will be, be in that book. Um, so we want to derive an effective internal coordinate ordinal structure. So we want to find, be able to use one of the, the degrees of freedom to, be, to play the role of the clock, at least an ordinal chronometric structure. We'll get to the, the chrono director structure later. Um, we need to, to do this, we need to separate a degree of freedom uh, and treat it in kind of, at least within this framework, allow it to behave semi-classically. And I'll explain a bit more about what that means later. The key question in terms of the derivation being kind of non-circular or satisfactory, even whether it's putting aside whether it's explanatory or not, is that, the structure, that we don't need to assume the structures we're trying to derive to do the derivation. And I know that uh, Nick has given a version of, of this paper where he went into a lot more detail about one particular part of this problem already to some of these people, so I'm not going to emphasize that. Uh, the paper, we should soon have it up on the archive, and if you want to know more, please do look at that. Um, so one aspect of the paper is challenging a claim by Chua and Callender that in fact, Kiefer and people who are following this program have committed some kind of vicious circularity or problematic uh, question begging and need to assume some of these, these temporal structures in order to do the derivation. And we, we don't agree with them, and I think we, we're fairly confident that we can show explicitly that, in fact, no such assumptions are necessary, and one can do this derivation without needing to assume the temporal structure one derives. Um, there's a lot of subtlety in the end about the difference between how things like the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and the WKB approximation are described heuristically in kind of intros to physics papers and in textbooks in temporal terms and how the actual details of the mathematics work. And in the end, I think that's, that's the crucial point. But I'm not going to have time to go through that, so I'm sorry, I'm going to rush a little bit over these subtleties. But in the, like, as I said in the paper, we go into a lot of detail and engage with, with Eugene and Craig and, and their particular criticisms. Really the important thing 
for our purposes, is just to follow the rough outlines of the derivation. Um, this equation is a very difficult equation to solve. And so what we can do, particularly justified by the relatively large, or relative to the other mass term, the large size of the Planck mass, uh, is follow this, this procedure that Born and Oppenheimer designed way back in the 1920s for application in, in molecular physics. We can do something <coughs> analogous, in certain respects at least, uh, to, to solve this equation. The important thing is that we're able to write the wave function via this, this separation so that we can decompose into these two parts, uh, one that relates to both the um, geometric degree of freedom and the matter degree of freedom, and one that only relates to the geometric degree of freedom, the C. Um, we can solve a reduced equation and find explicit form for this, this var phi variable. Um, and then crucially, under the approximation that this uh, this part of the wave function doesn't vary with respect to the, uh, the alpha variable, the geometric variable, <coughs> and the analog of this is saying in a, an atom that the uh, electron wave function, in a sense, doesn't vary uh, with respect to the nuclear uh, position, roughly. Um, so you're really, in some sense, we're saying the gravitational field is so heavy that we can think about the matter part of the wave function as approximately independent from it. In any case, once we apply these approximations, we can derive a simpler equation, which we still can't solve analytically, but which we can then apply a second approximation, the WKB approximation, and then solve that equation, and then write a full general solution for the, for the wave function that we can, we can check approximately solves the, the full equation. Um, so that's, in a sense, just a story about solving differential equations under some approximation. There's nothing to do with philosophy or time there. Um, what's important is that because we're taking this semi-classical approximation, we start being able to interpret the, part, or the alpha variable, the spatial variable, as being somewhat classicized uh, compared to the, the matter. Um, so we, we take the wave packets of peaks about classical trajectories, um, this is so that the WKB approximation even applies. And particularly, we want the de Broglie wavelength to be small compared to the characteristic distance over which the potential varies. And you can actually write this as also as a restriction on the uh, principal functional. And in a sense, we're kind of getting into a regime where the, uh, the hamilton jacobi equation is looking very close to the, the kind of Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Um, Again, so far we're just doing maths. This is the important step, that we then start thinking about the solution or the construction of particular solutions as something becoming something like a Cauchy problem, right? But what, rather than there being a Cauchy surface being fixed by a value <coughs> of the time parameter, the Cauchy surface is fixed by a value of the alpha parameter. And this is the important kind of transition to alpha now playing something more like the role of time. So we also, what we're going to do is, is want, it, want the, the solution to be such that we can, the full wave function can be uniquely fixed by defining um, the wave function for a particular value of alpha and for a particular uh, value of the gradient of the wave function at, at, evaluated at that value of alpha. So we start being able to do something that looks more like, and this is actually perhaps ironically closer to what Craig talks about time in his wonderful book in terms of being able to solve these, these well post Cauchy problems. Um, and so we're getting something like time back already. Um, what Kiefer does in, in, in the paper is really look explicitly at the, the spatially flat case, which is a much nicer case. Um, and in that case, we find that we can construct wave packets that approximately follow the, the classical trajectory in tubes. And I'll show a picture of this shortly. Uh, and in particular, they're such that we can build Gaussian wave packets and we can evolve them forward in this alpha clock and they approximately don't disperse and we get something like coherent states which follow the classical path. And it's starting to look like really like, like an idea of, of the, the kind of um, Arenthes type relations where you have the, the quantum variable or the quantum wave function, the bulk of it, following the classical path. So this is the picture. I mean, this is, this is actually not the spatially flat case. I'm just kind of slightly cheating by using different diagrams. 
But it's the same idea that in this WKB approximation where it's valid, we, the wave function approximately kind of follows a tube. Um, there's actually a recollapse, which is what we'll get back to. But for the moment, just imagine, focus on one half, and the wave function is kind of following the classical trajectory. Um, and what I think is interesting in this case is it gives us a, a handle on what it's, what it's like for time to emerge in, in a semi-classical program. Um, what we mean by time emerging in a semi-classical program is that the variable that we want to play the approximate role of time, the alpha variable, is beginning to play something like a classical time parameter-like role. Um, and what is that role? Well, we, one, I already talked about it a bit, we can specify the wave function via boundary conditions. It's not necessarily going to be a Cauchy problem. In fact, in the non-spatially flat case, we need both a future and, and uh, or we need two time boundaries. I won't call the future and past because that will prejudge the situation. Um, but in any case, what we want is to be able to fully specify the wave, wave function via boundary conditions on the variable, construct de determinant evolution. And then we also want something like the variable that we're, the alpha that we, we're playing the role of time. It's beginning to, at least approximately and at least locally, becomes something like a monotonically increasing parameter. Uh, and we get, so we're getting back something like, at least approximately and at least locally, something like a chrono-ordinal structure. And we're going to get some chronometric structure as well, because it's a parameter, we can start measuring temporal distances too. And so that's the, that's the kind of case in which things succeed. What's interesting, and I think which demonstrates that the calendar and Chua claim of circularity can't be right, is this can also fail. Um, so what Kiefer shows in the paper and the book is that, in fact, for at least some regimes, for the non-spatially flat case, uh, the WKB approximation can break down. Um, the evolution of wave packets with respect to the internal clock uh, spreads out from the classical trajectory uncontrollably uh, as we get to kind of bigger and bigger volumes. So we actually, in the end, at the, in these regimes, we're no longer getting the, the, the alpha variables no longer playing the functional role of time, um, even approximately. And so, as I said, this is interesting in the sense of the... the, the the problem of circularity, I think it shows that it can't be circular, in fact, because it can show how it can fail. Uh, it also, I think, is an interesting, at least potentially, insight into why it might be explanatory, because it allows us to answer these, at least in this thin sense, these what if things have been different questions. Um, I think this is quite interesting. Uh, this is an illustration. These are actually two continuations of the same diagram. This one showing the regime where the WKB still holds and then this one showing the regime where it, where it starts breaking down. Um, so, so far, so good, right? So we have a story about how time can emerge, or at least chrono-ordinal structure and chronometric structure can emerge. That story is such that it's not circular. It can also tell us something about how it might fail. What we'd also like to do is a story about if we are in this, re in this regime where it, it fails, the story to try and suggest why we wouldn't be in this regime where it fails. Um, and this really comes back to something Carlos said earlier, that when we talk about cosmology, we're really, for the most part, talking about uh, kind of a particular coarse graining of cosmological degrees of freedom. Um, so I like to think about this as the difference, a bit like hydrodynamics versus molecular fluid dynamics, right? And so when we do cosmology, we're usually doing something like fluid mechanics, hydrodynamic continuum fluid mechanics, but we can, of course, introduce perturbation in, in homogeneities, and we have to when we start including more and more details. And so what Kiefer suggests is this story about uh, the failure of classicization and the failure of this structure to emerge can be remedied by, or is the way that we understand why uh, it isn't going to be a problem is by considering inhomogeneities and their relevance. And the, the wonderful thing is this is also how Kiefer and Zay suggest the arrow of time comes into the story. Um, and so apologies, I'm going to switch variables a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't get confusing. Just forget about matter, OK? We're not going to include matter at all for, for the rest of the, this discussion. We're just going to focus on the, the geometric degrees of freedom, and we're just going to 
put everything difficult into a potential which we won't specify. Um, but what we are going to do is include inhomogeneities. So the alpha is these bulk homogeneous fluid, like continuum fluid dynamics type variables. These x's are, are representing inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> uh, inhomogeneous um, fluctuations in the spatial degrees of freedom. Okay? And so we introduced a set of these xi's. Um, now let's just suppose that this potential, and I'll come back to that supposition and why it's needs more needs to be said later. But let's just say, suppose that the potential is such that um, it goes to zero for this alpha going to minus infinity, which is the equivalent of the scale factor going to zero. So it's very, very small scales. Um, so what we do is we actually get, in some sense, by stipulation, a Wheeler-DeWitt equation that has an asymmetry with respect to the intrinsic time. So that the potential vanishes when alpha, when, when a gets very small, for very, very small bulk degrees of freedom, uh, the potential goes. I would have expected there to be a minus sign, not a minus or d2 by the alpha. Why? In front of this the, one? The Lorentzian form of the Wheeler de Witt operation. You know, there's the, the formal fact that has the so called wrong sign of the kinetic I, I I think this is correct, but I might be wrong. But these are both spatial degrees of these are both geometric degrees of freedom. Right. There's only one negative. Oh, you mean in front of both of them? No, one one. 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 I, I might be wrong. I would have So I, I may, I, in the past, I have very often transcribed equations missing minus signs. So this may be true, but I'll double check. So there, so, so assumption one, right? Uh, by the way, I mean, this is a very speculative model, right? So we're now in a regime where we're just trying to do something to try and understand what goes on with the hour of time and homogeneities in quantum cosmology. This is a toy model. I think it's quite, quite interesting properties. Um, the first thing we do is assume this form of this potential. Um, the second thing we do is assume, uh, it's a shame Barry's not here, assume a simple boundary condition, uh, which is very much, in some ways at least, very much like a past hypothesis. Um, so really what we do um, is assume that the... Um, Wave, the potential is such that the coupling between the bulk variables and the inhomogeneities tends to zero if alpha goes to minus infinity, which we've already described. And we are, that's compatible with imposing a, a boundary condition where in this regime, this very, very small volume regime, small distance regime, uh, the wave function, the bit of the wave function that depends upon the bulk variables and the bit of the wave function that depends upon the inhomogeneities uh, we, can put, we can write them in terms of a product state. Uh, we assume the initial state asymptotically takes the form of a product state such that the bulk variables and the homogeneities have vanishingly small entanglement. It's a big assumption. Uh, so we then have that if equation 4 is taken as the initial condition, then the Wheeler-DeWitt equation uh, would, through the form of the potential, lead to a wave function with some kind of intrinsic error of type. Uh, so it's already very interesting. Uh, what's even more interesting is that we can then uh, combine these. Uh, I mean, I, I guess we've already said this. Uh, so the equation, the dynamical equation that we get from three combined with a simple boundary condition mean that for increasing alpha, we, we get increasing entanglement between the alpha and the inhomogeneous modes. Because we start off with no entanglement and the potential kicks in. They start coupling, start getting entangled. What we can then do and this is quite familiar from a lot of approaches to the hour of time, uh, is define an entropy measure where we trace out some subset of the inhomogeneities. Um, so we take, uh, we interpret the process in terms of an increase in local entropy. So I mean, the, for the, this is a pure state, right? So the entropy is always, the volumen entropy is always zero, right? So we need a bit more to start linking this um, thing that looks like an intrinsic hour of time to an anthropic hour of time. And what we do is we actually say, look, 
we'll take a subset of these x's and say that these are the kind of relevant ones and the rest are irrelevant. Um, we define the, the kind of von Neumann entropy measure based upon the reduced entropy matrix where we've traced out the irrelevant ones. And then, we've, in fact, by, by the way we've set things up, uh, we're going to get an anthropic error of time. For bigger alpha, we get more and more entropy. How am I doing for time, in fact? You've almost uh, talked for half an hour now. Oh, perfect, perfect. Um, so let me just say the assumptions again. Um, <coughs> we have the simple boundary condition, so idea of, of, of the product state with vanishing small entanglement at early times. I think a lot more needs to be said about that justification. Kiefer has some more recent work where he wants to connect it to a quantum version of the, the uh, penrose val curvature hypothesis, which would then connect to the, a lot of these discussions about the um, past hypothesis in, in the philosophy and, and the physics literature. But at the moment, this is really just a, a kind of speculative proposal. Um, the second one, which I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in myself, um, is really thinking about the justification of the uh, coarse graining or of the separation between the relevant and irrelevant degrees of freedom. I think probably that's something which we want to, obviously, we are, we want to be the relevant degree, part of the relevant degrees of freedom, such as also suns and other things. I would imagine we would understand the irrelevant ones as some kind of noise, CMB noise or something like that. But this needs to be shown explicitly how this kind of story would work. And also that we can justify this decoupling between relevant and irrelevant in some kind of dynamical story. Um, I think that's kind of interesting. It's the kind of thing that you could imagine a derivation that really was quite satisfactory if it, if it can be done for these kind of models. Um, and then we finally we get this, this assumption that we can connect um, once we define this von Neumann entropy measure of the reduced entropy matrix, we, have, we can connect this, it's the salient structure to give us the coronal ordinal structure. Um, so, I, so I think, so far as it goes, this is a very interesting model. It's a consistent model, but it's perhaps not able to give us the level of explanatory kind of power as, as the other uh, derivations, because it's not giving us quite as much um, capacity to tell stories about how things would be different, uh, how, how things could have been different. Um, so I just want to finish by, by, as I said, going back to 1996. Uh, Hugh Price wrote this, this wonderful book, um, we can kind of, a lot of his arguments have this form. Uh, I, I just wanted to kind of put up a kind of classic philosopher's premise conclusion form because I think it's quite helpful. Um, consider a physical argument towards the emergence of chrono-directed chrono structure via the der derivation of some structure along some temporal orientation. Okay? We're not in a timeless picture anymore. Just assume we've got some temporal orientation and we want to pick out the emergence of chrono-directed chrono structure. Um, either that argument is insensitive to temporal orientation and then we could have equally well applied it in the other temporal orientation, right? And so we, we seem to have derived too many arrows of time with two of them. Or uh, the argument can only have applied in one temporal direction, in which case we've already got the chrono-directed structure so we don't seem to have derived it. And you, you look at in almost every chapter, the kind of... Uh, analysis that he does has this, this quite similar structure. Um, so the idea is that, well, that ultimately, and he uses this mainly to argue for what's now an outdated model, the gold universe, is the, the way we should have think about uh, cosmology and time. Uh, the idea of what he's arguing towards, he's saying, look, we should really um, have chrono-directed structure emerging in both temporal directions. Um, we shouldn't think about there being a, a, a kind of master arrow of time, we should think about there being uh, a kind of particular kind of temporal symmetry of the arrows of time, something like that. Um, what's, I think, a, a really great uh, missed opportunity is that one of Price's targets is um, uh, work by, by, by Hawking, a particular uh, interpretation of the no boundary proposal um, by Hawking and collaborators. Um, in fact, Kiefer and Zay spend about a third of their paper also arguing ag against exactly the same parts of, of Hawking and collaborators' argument. And it's written exactly the same time as, as, as Hugh's book, but unfortunately there doesn't seem to have been any interaction between them at all. Um, so it's a little bit of a missed opportunity that 
these things weren't brought together earlier. I mean, I, mean, I, I should actually ask each of them if, they, if they're aware of each other's work. In any case, what, what Price and, in fact, Kiefer and Zay argue uh, is what they're arguing against is not the no-boundary proposal per se. It's a particular interpretation of the no-boundary proposal, where in this, is, these later papers with collaborators and, and on his own, 1993, 1994, Hawken argues that we should only apply the no-boundary proposal at one end of the universe. Um, ha earlier, Hawken argued that we should um, really, or, or the position he articulated is that we should, um, the arrow of time would reverse in a recollapsing universe, and the, new, uh, the no boundary proposal would apply uh, to the limit uh, at both temporal extremities. And so there's two different ways of approaching the no boundary proposal one in which it's, we pick out uh, one particular kind of extremity, we apply it there, and the other one we apply it twice. And both Keithler and Zay and Price are arguing for the second one, as Hawken did earlier himself. Um, and this is what Price says. This is, again, the general argument pattern. <coughs> Hawken hasn't shown that asymmetric universes are the natural product of a symmetric theory. On the contrary, he seems to have assumed the required asymmetry by taking the boundary proposal to apply to only one end of, the, of an arbitrary universe. This amounts to putting the asymmetry in by hand. And I don't want to refight the Hawken-Price debate. That's not what I'm... I'm here for. What's interesting is that it's quite clear then the style of argument, the style of criticism that Price is making of Hawking doesn't apply to Kiefer and Zay. Uh, their kind of approach doesn't have this putting the asymmetry in by hand, at least not in the specific way that uh, Price is worried about. Perhaps it does in other ways to form the potential special boundary condition but not the specific problem. So Price is kind of wants to, to say, look, um, what we, what's problematic is justifying the choice of an order disorder universe, i.e. low entropy to higher universe, as opposed to an order, order universe, i.e. Uh, low entropy, high entropy, low entropy, um, based upon time symmetric laws, and justifying a particular labeling of a particular set as initial rather than final. There are two problems that he, he, he identifies. And these don't seem to apply to Kiefer and Zay's model. We have atemporal laws for one, and the asymmetry with respect to alpha rather than the, uh, and it's also in the form of potential. Moreover, the simple boundary condition is not postulated as an initial condition. It is just a boundary condition that applies for alpha goes to, zero, to minus infinity, uh, irrespective of whether that's, that's boundaries we encountered twice. Um, so I think it's very clear that the Kiefer and Zay model really avoids this uh, prices that temporal double standards argument, and it gives a way that we can understand the emergence of chrono-directed chrono structure that at least avoids that problem. Um, and, and very interestingly, uh, Klaus Kiefer, in fact, gave a talk about some of this material and lots of other stuff as well uh, to the Geneva Symmetry Group last year. And I watched the video, and at some point he actually says, the expansion of the universe becomes a tautology. And I think that's the way to think about the way that this model uh, sets up the kind of concepts of uh, time and expansion. There's just, we're just defining time as the increase of the universe, increase of the universe volume. Um, but I mean, at least I think hopefully some of you might have been worrying a bit about the temporal way I'm telling the story about the universe expanding and then recollapsing. Um, perhaps it makes more sense to not say that the arrow of time reverses and the universe recollapses. Rather, what we've in fact got is a situation in which we have a transition between two universes, each with emergent arrows of time oriented away from the low volume regime. Uh, the arrow in question, when it's well-defined, always points away from the, out, the, the kind of very small volume regime and towards the very big volume regime. And it's by definition aligned with the expansion of the universe. What's interesting then is what happens in between. Um, and this is the very strange thing about the model, which I think is probably pathological, to be honest. Um, in this model, we in fact have the breakdown at very late times of, of chrono-ordinal 
and chronometric and chronodirected structure. Um, the model provides a mechanism for chronodirected structure to disappear as well as emerge. Um, so it's not true in this model that the, that this, the structure is always well defined at late times. For very, very large universes, it can, can, can disintegrate again. Um, and the way Kiefer and Zay describe this is in terms of there not being a classical connection between different legs across the turning point, rather we encounter a large A region which can't be interpreted in, in classical terms. So this is very odd, right? We're used to thinking about quantum gravity comes in when we have very, very high matter density, so very, very kind of small volumes early universe. But in this model, we actually find non-classical behavior for very, very large um, large volumes. Um, and this is pretty perplexing. Holding that fixed for one second, really what the story is then is a model of <coughs> emergence, disappearance, and re-emergence. Um, or more consistently, a story of two universes with independent emergent arrows of time whose temporal structure dissolves and they merge into a large volume deep quantum regime. Um, we can't, I mean, satisfactorily for Price, this is incredibly symmetric. But it's more than a little perplexing why we have this breakdown of classicality for very, very large volumes. Um, so this is my, my kind of little silly graphic of the picture. Um, and in the end, we actually have two. This doesn't work, right? Um, we have three regions which are kind of confusing. So firstly, as I said right at the beginning, this model doesn't have singularity resolution. So we actually get breakdown in the equations for, for, for very, very small a, which is encountered twice. But we also get some kind of slightly un unexplained uh, deep quantum regime that happens in this middle bit. Um, and so following uh, Julian Barber, I want to call this an inverted Janus universe. Rather than a recollapsed universe, we think about the universe as having two arrows of time that, that point to get toyed like this. And I think this is an interesting story in part because we might be able to use some of the resources and some of the responses to price and some of the stories that we've told about this slightly unrealistic model for a more realistic model, which is usually called a big bounce. But I think, again, we, shouldn't, we should move away from this idea of recollapse or bounce and really, uh, again, following things that, that Nick and Chris have said, try to talk in a kind of atemporal terms about the structure of the universe. And it, the Barber, Barber's metaphor is of the I think Roman god Janus, who has two, who's a god of time, who has two faces pointing away from each other. And so the idea is that I did, we'd also like to have something, some story about uh, which avoids the singularity here, and we kind of glue these two universes together. But we shouldn't think, I, I think, about having a master hour of time, uh, which, which you do in some bouncing scenarios. So epichirotic bounces do have this master arrow that goes along with the the, the kind of bouncing cycle. But I think there's good aesthetic and perhaps physical reasons to, to, to follow Kiefer's idea of making the expansion of the universe a tautology and linking uh, temporal process to the size of the universe, in which case we end up with this, this Janus picture with the two arrows of time both pointing away from the kind of quantum gravity regime, and then this, these large-scale regimes being, being classical. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Vincent will have the opportunity to present his comment. Oh, the microphone. So, first one of the slides. Just, just one slide. So very good. First, um, I must say I'm, I'm very happy to be to be here. Sorry for not. Uh, been here yesterday, but today it's very nice, very nice discussions, um, and uh, I'm, I'm not in, uh, organizing this at all, but I'm, I'm the local one, I'm living uh, in the region, so I'm very happy to, to have you here enjoying this, this, this region, it's, it's a nice region, it's well known for the sun, so, <laughs> uh, so, I'm, so uh, I'm, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the paper, Karim, uh, it's, it's it's very, very interesting. Um, uh, in, in general, I think I'm, I'm very sympathetic, and it fits very well to the kind of within the kind of framework about the kind of functional emergence of, of uh, space-time and of time. 
um, we've been uh, advocating uh, and Chris, with Chris and, and, and Chris and, and Nick, of course. Uh, so in general, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to, 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 to this. And so I've not so much comments rather than questions, <laughs> a lot of questions actually, and, and, and then I'm just open for, 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 for discussion, I think. I just made you one comment. I think it's interesting. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, maybe you can, you, can, you can also comment on this. I see here kind of double role for entanglement in a certain sense, because uh, it's, of course it's one in, 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 in quantum gravity and in, in, in the other it's, it's, it's in this uh, very toy model in, in the quantum uh, uh, cosmology, but there is this, this, this role of kind of gluing relation uh, in, in several approaches in, 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 in quantum gravity for, uh, for entanglement. And here we've just seen um, uh, with this uh, with this uh, decoherence scenario that entanglement also plays a role in in uh, as kind of in, in the decoherence mechanism. Again, whatever its interpretation uh, is, somehow uh, you have you have the time simply from the increase in, in, in local entanglement uh, entropy. Uh, so I think it's 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 an interesting uh, double role that entanglement is 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 playing here, and maybe. There's a kind of intuition that it really points again. Whatever your interpretation of, of or understanding of quantum mechanics is, uh, here it's decoherence in a certain sense. So it seems that it, 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 in a kind of neutral way, interpretation neutral way, points to kind of fundamental features uh, of at the quantum at the quantum gravity level. And again, it also fits well with other kind of speculative suggestions in 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 in, in, in quantum. Um, now questions. Um, I had a look again at this, this the, the book by Klaus you, you, you mentioned. It's very dense, a lot of ideas there, especially in this at the, at the end of the book where, where this is discussing all this. And it's very ambitious actually. I, I didn't remember that. He's, he's actually pointing to a kind of link, uh, the kind of master hour you mentioned, and linking everything together. The, not only the thermodynamic and equational asymmetries, but also the quantum mechanical asymmetries, the quantum uh, measurement process somehow. And it seems to be suggesting that everything is linked to, together. So uh, I was wondering whether you have s some thoughts on, on, on this, and to what extent it's, it, it's dependent on the kind of interpretation you take, you take on, on uh, the understanding of, of, of quantum theory as a kind of everything uh, perspective, but it seems Again, uh, he seems to be pointing at everything being connected there. And just a, 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 a comment here, I think it nicely fits with uh, uh, Carlos' talk this morning and the, the reference to the Heisenberg cuts, because here it's, it's, he's using the Heisenberg cut, this distinction between the relevant and irrelevant uh, degrees of freedom, and uh, this is what you, what you were referring at this morning as the kind of Heisenberg cuts. Um, so maybe it fits well with, with relational uh, uh, the relation on quantum mechanics. Um, and now, kind of more specific question. Uh, in your paper, you, you didn't, yeah, you, you, you didn't mention that in talk. To what extent, uh, considering the, this, this, uh, so the, the, the product states, uh, the simple boundary condition, as a boundary rather than an initial condition. Uh, okay, I see, I see, I see the arguments uh, formally, but then to what extent it's, does it avoid really the spirit of the of the kind of uh, of the kind of price price objection or price argument? Um, and um, and also this is not something you mentioned in this, in the talk, but I found very interesting in the paper. Uh, so uh, there is this idea that the the, like mimicking a little bit the debate about the past hypothesis that we shouldn't understand somehow this kind of boundary condition here as being law-like, nomological in a certain sense, rather than fact-like in a certain sense. And I'm just wondering to what extent, uh, what are exactly the consequences of considering this as, as, uh, as law-like, in particular when it comes to the explanatory demands um, uh, that, 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 that follow. Um, and, and then if we take this kind of uh, simple binary condition as low-like, nomological, uh, then what are, to what extent does it depend on the, the account of, of, of laws that, uh, that you're considering? And, and of course you'll need a kind of non-spatial temporal account of, of, of law if 
you want to understand it as, as a kind of nomological entity. And finally, yeah, <coughs> like really, this is for everybody. Well, it's, so of course, this is this is a toy model and so on. But of what you think are the possible implications for for uh, 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 quantum gravity and quantum cosmology and the emergence of time in general in other approaches uh, to to quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. Open for discussion. I'm not sure I can answer all of them particularly well. I have no idea about this. I'll, I'll have to read more and maybe we'll have some comment. I mean, I think my, I mean, I often worry a little bit about the, maybe I shouldn't worry. I often worry a little bit about the role of um, some kind of epistemic considerations or some kind of agent or some kind of need to consider the perspective of some information processing system when we talk about these entanglement entropies. Uh, I, I, I quite like this distinction between objective subjective and epistemic ontic. And I, 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 I think it is clear that we shouldn't think about these entropies as subjective. I don't think that's right. I don't think we can, there, are, there are kind of constraints on the way we should or the way we can um, define these entropies. But it's not clear to me whether they're ontic or epistemic. Mm. Uh, in particular, like when we divide between relevant and irrelevant, we need some quite clear story that this is not something that's based upon our particular, the precision of our measurements or the interests that we're using or the time scale on which we're, we're kind of, we think is salient for a particular purpose. And so I think these are the kind of questions we need to answer about entanglement entropies. If we get, if the, I mean, entanglement entropies that are built in this way by tracing out degrees of freedom, if we want them to be fundamental features of the ontology, we need to know whether we're okay with fundamental features of our ontology having this kind of epistemic component. But I actually find, to some extent, with saying that there is some role, perhaps not for humans, but some role for um, information processing systems or something like that in these divisions, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I think there is a potential story to tell about this link. I haven't looked at the details. I think this new work by Kiefer on mm. thinking about the simple boundary condition as a, a quantum version of the Weil hypothesis is probably the way to go, because then you can start connecting Weil curvature to these other, these other arrows, or the increase in Weil curvature to these other arrows. Um, I, I think really the place to go for, for, for the something all of these points which I wouldn't try and redo myself is this debate between calendar and price mm -hmm. uh, 2004 or something um, I, I, I think so I mean, on one side there's this idea that expansionary demands must terminate somewhere I mean it's, this is a lovely rhetorical line I think it's from Brass who says this um, which is all well and good but I think it's not clear that this is the relevant place for them to terminate um, I mean particularly in this case we need to we need to have a clear story about why this potential has this magical form that it, it just does exactly the work that we need to, need to do. Um, and moreover, I think, I, I don't think there's a fundamental difference between laws and boundary conditions, uh, really. I think we should, maybe perhaps in context of experimentation there is. In the context of cosmology, it doesn't seem to be why, why we should make that a fundamental distinction. Um, the virtue of this, in a sense, is the simple virtue is that um, the keeper is a way of setting it up means that we don't have to say that this is a this is the initial time, right? So that's I think one thing that, 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 that some of the thrusts of, of price specific worry about Hawking's specific approach to their boundary proposal uh, works with. Um, in terms of doing something better, I mean I think I'm quite sympathetic to the the Barber program where you don't have a special initial. Um, or a special boundary state or a special state at all and you get this out of some kind of generic attractor in the dynamics. This has only really been worked out for 
these n-body theories. It's not clear how if, if it would apply in general to cosmology. But I, I, I'm quite attracted to the. Oh, this isn't my phone. It's yours. Um, I'm quite attracted to the this this picture where you have. Um, some kind of generic dynamics that, that um, so if you imagine a kind of basin of attraction and then there's some generic point where you find that the, the trajectories kind of converge, this is probably not a good representation of what, what they do in this PKM paper, but the idea is that this way you don't have to set things up by choosing a, a special condition, you get it out of the, some kind of generic feature of the structure of the boundary space, and I think that's the kind of story that I take to be perhaps more explanatory that doesn't require initial boundary conditions, but I have no idea how to apply that kind of story to, mm -hmm. to cosmology. I'm sure that the kind of shape dynamics by people who've been working on it might do. Um, I think that was, that was most of the things that I wanted to say in response. I don't think that covered everything you said, but that's that everything I could think of. Thank you. All right, so let's open the floor for um, comments, Tyler. Uh, billions of comments and questions. This is very nice. So let me let me uh, skip to a couple. Uh, what are the classical trajectories here? In the, in, what are the classical trajectories? Oh. Okay, so so they would be the. Um, I guess they, they go out in A or come back. Sorry, let me just think about the question more clearly. In the, um, in the A phi space. In the A phi space. There's a classical trajectory. There's a classical trajectory. So you start from A equals zero, goes out. And it goes out. So they're, free, they're sorry, they're Friedman solutions, right? Well, but the Friedman solutions that go out or some that come back. So they're Friedman solutions that re, that that um they they are the gold solutions, right? Sorry. The gold solutions, the ones that go out and then come back. Oh, these are the ones that come. Yeah, because we have no cosmological constant and the matter density. I think they're the ones that expand out and come back, which are exactly the ones that Price writes about in the book. Cause I think they're called gold universes. So these uh, are. Uh, so the, the, the thing to approximate is that they go out to come back. Exactly. So A as a time is good until you come back. Yeah, that's not that what you would expect this, right? To some extent, right? That you, ha you have to have some kind of regime where... No, no, I just want to try to understand that. That's, that's, that makes sense. So um, the, this is very interesting because it's... Uh, I, I would say that the magic is not in the potential, but it's, 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 really, it's in the fact that you have a way of putting a boundary sense that it's, it's, it's approximated in terms of mass like that. So it is very interesting to work with. Um, second comment, just I want to read something you said in answering the question where you said, well, all because are epistemic uh, with regard to the entanglement entropy. Uh, this is, that entanglement you're using is neither quantic nor epistemic. It's just relative. Uh, that but is, relative means relative to a certain cut. There's a certain distinction between the degrees of freedom. So given that Nothing mental, epistemic, nothing about knowledge. Nothing but if the distinction depends upon our choice about what's relevant and irrelevant, then it would be. But I accept that it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, it's like philosophy to something. It doesn't depend on our choice. It's sure. relative to knowledge. It's, sure. it's objective. It's subjective. Right. That's so important. to the extent in which then in our microscopic description we use certain variables is a well defined entity with respect to this variable. So I think that's correction. Right. I agree. I mean, to that extent, right? Uh, I mean, some people want something more than that. Oh. And I, I think they may have to give up on that, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, strictly so, speaking, the entropy is always zero, right? Yeah. So that, I think that's the thing we have, to, we have to accept, and that the entropy being increasing is a product of something that's relative to something that's greater. So now, I don't... So, point for three. Why is that... In which sense the... In which, I, I perfectly understand in which sense the time goes wrong when, when the universe is large, because if you're using as time, the clock goes back, and since there's yeah, yeah. a fuzziness in the wave bucket, that's, that's a, but why would you say there is a quantum regime there, rather than a, 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 a regime whether in, in that part, uh, locally something else would, would work as a good clock? So I think there are two separate things. Yeah. There's the clock breaking down, and there's the class, the semi-classical regime of the model breaking down. Yeah. So so let's. And so I think the first thing, the clock breaking down, that particular clock breaking 
<laughs> at some point you say, well, we use fear, fire as a clock. Sure. That's good. But then you say, on top of this, there's the fact that the wind packet spreads a lot. So I, I have to look at the paper again, but certainly that's the way they conceptualize it. Um, that you can no longer use some classical approximations and you need to tell some story. But isn't that because of the, of the approximation? I, I had a long paper long ago with, with the Mr. Clapper. Classical trajectories are, are, are ellipses. Uh -huh. And then we do the full quantum theories, you see, so everything is more defined and it's more consistent. And then we ask if there's something tiny here. And then if you, the amount of time to be more defined from minus P to plus infinity, you know. But locally, I mean, there are solutions which I know, solution of the middle mid equation, which sits exactly on the classical trajectory uh -huh. on, 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 and go around. Yeah, it's Liz Yu Fissions, right? Isn't it? Sorry? They're called something, I can't pronounce it. Something begins with L, Liz Yu Fissions. I think Kiefer looks at these as well, right? They have this really nice shape. No, this no? is a paper with colossi things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it might be different paper, different and, structure. And, I don't know. And, uh, the, the time uh, representation of what goes on in that approximation is, is good locally, provided at some point you change what you mean by time, or from one variable to sure, sure, sure. time variable. So I, I think this is a different issue. Uh, it, but, this but, is a different but, uh, issue. Uh, you're you're saying in this model, there is a large spreading of the wave function. Exactly. And so my suspicion is that this is related to some stuff that um, Stefan Gillen and collaborators have looked at. That because a lot of this, I mean, I wouldn't say this thing we're calling it. Um, I think, I'm not sure that this model is self-adjoint and that the, the Hamiltonian has been fully, fully well constructed. Um, and yeah. so what Stefan and collaborator have a model that's similar to this, and they actually end up putting in a self-adjoint extension that bounces the wave function back. And at least they argue that this is a kind of pathological feature of certain clock choice and certain models. I'm not sure. But are there other states where that you chose a state in a sense? Sure. Right? Full invariance approximations. And are there other states which are not spread also? So I don't know. I don't know. That'll be a question for, for the class. Thanks. <laughs>